As we reported earlier, there have been shifting explanations from Virginia's governor in response to a racist photo uncovered in his medical school yearbook. Yamiche Elsendor reports on the pressure Governor Ralph Northam now faces. A governor under fire and a state reeling. This morning outside Virginia Governor Ralph Northam's official residence, one sign carried a message he heard all weekend, resign. But Northam has refused to step down. Instead, at the Virginia State House today, he met with his staff. That didn't stop the Republican House Speaker from adding his voice to a chorus of people demanding that Northam tender his resignation. Regardless of the veracity of the photograph, the governor's lost the confidence of the people and cannot effectively govern. The photograph appears on Northam's page on his medical school yearbook from 1984. It shows two people looking at the camera, one in blackface, wearing a hat, bow tie, and plaid pants, the other in a Ku Klux Klan robe. Friday evening, Northam said he was indeed in the photo, and he apologized. That photo and the racist and offensive attitudes it represents does not reflect that person I am today or the way that I have conducted myself as a soldier, a doctor, and a public servant. I am deeply sorry. But less than 24 hours later, he reversed course. Uh, I tell the truth. I'm telling the truth today. That was not my picture. During a Saturday press conference, he said he was positive he was not in the picture. He also refused to resign. The governor did admit that he wore blackface on a different occasion in 1984. In San Antonio at a dance, he said he darkened his face with black shoe polish to look like Michael Jackson. And we are calling on him to resign. Throughout the weekend, the governor faced mounting pressure from all sides to step down. Those calling for him to leave office include Virginia's Republican and Democratic parties, the Commonwealth's Democratic House and Senate caucuses, its attorney general, plus the state's two Democratic senators, Mark Warner and Tim Kaine, and Democratic National Committee Chairman Tom Perez. At least five Democratic presidential candidates also called for Northam to step down. On Sunday, NAACP President Derek Johnson also said he should resign. Whether he actively participated or passively was, was present, he not one time up until this point acknowledged that this took place, objected to that behavior, or stated that, you know, I had a different upbringing and I was a part of a Southern culture that embraced this racist, vile behavior, and I'm a changed man now. Next in line to replace Northam is the current lieutenant governor, Justin Fairfax, a 39-year-old African-American lawyer. Last month in the Virginia State House, Fairfax protested the celebration of Robert E. Lee's birthday. But Fairfax also faces potential trouble. A woman alleges he sexually assaulted her. Fairfax said today the claim is a, quote, uncorroborated smear. To discuss how Governor Northam fits into a larger conversation about race in America, I'm joined by Mark Anthony Neal. He's a professor of African and African American studies at Duke University and the author of several books, including New Black Man. Also joining me is Van Newkirk. He writes about politics and policy for The Atlantic. Now, thank you both for joining me. I want to first talk to you a little bit about blackface. This is something that has been used to mock and dehumanize African Americans for decades. Let's look at this. Mark, first to you, for people who don't understand, why is that so offensive? It's a caricature of black life. Um, before the pre-electronic era, before television, radio, and even film, it was blackface minstrelsy was one of the most popular forms of entertainment in the United States in the 19th and early 20th century. And it always was about making a mockery of black folks, dehumanizing black folks. Blackface seems to be the line that people have crossed and said, mm -hmm. you know what, this is where we're not gonna have people um, talk about or even joke about blackface. Why do you think that line is there? Well, I think, like Mark said, you know, given the history, given the fact that it was a staple of an exclusive and exclusionary and racist regime of media, it's one we all know well to be racist. And so I think when people go and, and act out and continually do it, it's kind of the easiest one to spot and root out. And I, I think people react so vehemently about it because there's no real def defense of it in, as any type of legitimate art. It is completely racist and we all know it to be so. 
Vanna is talking about completely racist. Um, Congressman Steve King, Mark, still has a job after <laughs> questioning whether or not the term white supremacy should right. be offensive. Donald Trump has been called a racist by the NAACP. Why do you think those men keep their jobs and there's this swift and widespread condemnation of Governor Northam? Because it's about the optics. You know, when you think about the discourse coming from the president or, or Congressman King, right, you could always go back and forth about how these people were misinterpreted. But when you see the optics of blackface, right, that there's no way to get around it. You know, for the most part, you know, it's been something that hasn't been in the public sphere, you know, since the mid-1950s. It's largely gone underground. And because of social media now, it is so much easier now to go back and track where it's been underground and, and have it bubble up in public in ways that we hadn't seen before. And it's a reminder, right, of a racist past that folks don't really absolutely want to deal with, even as it resonates so powerfully in the moment. Van, he's talking about optics. Do you think it's optics? Do you think it's something deeper? I think it is mostly optics. You know, I think the fact that it's it's so easy to spot <laughs> and it's such a bright line, easy line to not cross, <laughs> um, that definitely plays. But also, I think there's a larger uh, issue at, at play here, which is the fact that there, of course, if we're talking about the possibility of making some people who disenfranchise black people or throw them in prison, if it comes to the point where we can talk about them leaving office, that's a conversation we should have. Uh, but it, it's the prohibition, the taboo against certain easily to, easy to spot uh, actions of bigotry, those I think play a function in uh, making it so you can actually police those more subtle things. If, if you get rid of the prohibition on the really uh, red line, uh, easy bigotry, then you can almost do nothing about anything else. And Van, you wrote about Governor Northam's policies. He campaigned on $15 minimum wage. He talked about Medicare for all or health care, single payer health care, um, free community college. Do you think that people can or should separate his policies from his rhetoric and this and this photo of him? And can other people do that? Can other people say, I did once appear in blackface, but now I have policies that are going to help black people? So um, I used to live in Virginia, and I have I've talked to lots of people, uh, black voters there especially. Um, and I think, number one, the sense is black voters are nothing if not pragmatic, right? They're strategic, mm -hmm. and they're thinking about this from, from the, the game theory scenario. And the fact that he, the people behind him in the line of succession are Democrats, are people who are going to put forward the same policy agenda, is definitely part of uh, sort of the, the, the ease in calling for him uh, to be ousted. And I do think there are, especially in Virginia, where symbols are so much of a part of the conversation, where the symbols of the Confederacy are, dominate the state, and they were kind of the reason behind Charlottesville and, and the, pro, the, deadly pro, the deadly rallies there, um, I don't know if you can really take the symbolism away from the larger policy agenda. Uh, the fact that you want, they're, they're looking for a governor, a leader who is going to stand up against uh, people who are saying this is the cradle of the Confederacy and pushing a neo-Confederate neo agenda. How do you have the moral authority now to do those things if you are revealed to be kind of of the same cloth? I think that, ma that matters. What do you make of that, Mark? I think that's dead on. Um, I think we have to hold people accountable, regardless of what side of the aisle they're on. Um, I think it also reflects on the way for African American voters and, and knowing the longer history of racism in the medical industry, um, even if it wasn't the governor, right, there are obviously two people who are in medical school that are somebody's doctors these days that are holding these views or held these views. Um, I think you have to make hard decisions about what kind of folks you want to represent. And I think the fact that there is, you know, a successor in line who's an African American makes it easier to put that pressure on at this point in time. Mark is talking about healthcare policy. You were in healthcare policy before you got in a journalism van. What do you make of people who look at this picture of a yearbook, medical school yearbook, and say, that could be my doctor? Yeah. And then you, th you couple that with the idea that there are these disparities in healthcare where African American women are three or four times more likely to die in childbirth. What do you make of that? Well, if you look at the medical workforce, most of those folks are older white men. Most of my physicians have been older white men. So you're talking about people who are in this age group who, you know, going to schools like this, who likely have yearbook photos like this. And I imagine that yearbook photos, uh, if you have yearbook photos where people are dressing up as a clan, there are a lot of other attitudes and behaviors that go well beyond that. And, and so you're talking about these people going and making decisions where it's life or death sometimes, yes, but where it's subtle. 
where you have to understand the nuances of black pain and how people express pain and deal with pain differently, where you have to be able to uh, walk the line between telling a patient, a, a woman in a difficult labor, what to do and listening to her. And I guarantee, you know, I've, I've worked in cultural and health uh, competency and literacy. Those are really small things that lots of people miss. And I guarantee lots of people who have really bigoted and racist backgrounds miss that matter in terms of, you know, these are really razor thin margins when a woman's coming in and, and she's uh, close to, uh, having a hemorrhage when she's in labor. These things matter. And Mark, what do you make of the visceral reaction that people have, the pain that people feel when they see that yearbook photo? It's a reminder. There's no question it's a reminder. It's a reminder that black folks have been dehumanized and they're still de dehumanized in the American imagination. It's a reminder of America's racist past, um, obviously for older generations of African Americans, but also for young folks who thought at this point in time that we'd be well beyond conversations about blackface. Um, it is absurd that we're talking about blackface in 2019 as, gother, uh, as the governor um, referencing winning uh, a moonwalk contest, you know, back in 1984. Well, thank you to both of you for joining me. Van Newkirk of the Atlantic and Mark Anthony Neal of Duke University, thank you. Thank you.